Father God, you are the creator of heaven and earth, and your glory stems from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Father, again, I pray to prayer, Samson. Let that anointing fall just one more time, and let it reach out and touch every person here by the power that you have placed in your words, that their lives will never be the same. And we ask this not for anything that we have done, but we ask this in the name of your Son, Yeshua HaMashiach. For it's only through that name we can stand before your holy throne of grace, praising you, lifting you up, and glorifying your holy name. Amen. Hang on to your hats. I'm not joking. I have probably one of the strongest Porsches that are going to exist today, and for more than one reason. You have to remember what happened the last Porsche. The last Porsche are the 10 spies. And because of what they did, guess what? Out of, the, out of that whole generation, they are not, generation except for two people, are not going to enter into the promised land. And that was a major rebellion. The rebellion is about to continue for one man. And that man's name is Korath. When you wind up taking a look at the Korath, this is the outline that you've got. You have two, it's from Numbers chapter 16, from 1 to 18, verse 32. And what you've got is the basis of the two rebellions of Korth and Dathan and Avram. you got the people's mummering and the plague. you got Aaron's rod uh, budding. you got the duties of the Levites, and you got the priest portion. I could have picked any one of those up, and I could have talked for three hours. All I got is about 40 minutes, but you are going to get overloaded in that 40 minutes. I'll tell you that right now. But you have to realize, originally, Numbers chapter 16, 17, and 18 were considered all one unit. And then they later divided it up into bite-sized chapters. But before I started, I, I, with the teens here, I got to ask you a question. Are you the devil's monkey? I'm not joking. When you wind up, you have to realize something. In Africa, they would capture the monkeys in this way. First of all, they're going to go to the, where the monkeys hang out. Uh, that's, that's the basis of what they're going to do, the water supply. And what they're going to do at that point is they're going to place a cage that has bars but no door to get in. And when you're dealing with that, it has no interest. Now, on the inside of that cage, they're going to put the bait. And at that particular point, what's going to happen is the monkey's going to try to get that bait, but the only way he's going to get that bait is he's got to reach in to the bars to get it. And once he reaches into that bar and got the bait, he's got the bait. He can't get his hands out. Why? Because his fists will not let him go through the bars. And the only way he's going to get loose from that trap is to let go of the bait. He doesn't, and they got him trapped. They're captured because they won't let go of the bait. Guess what? Satan has that same trap laid out for you. When he winds up doing all four things, now here's what the Satan has to do to hit you on that trap. Number one, he's got to make it easy for the prey to get in and hard to get out. The second one is he's got to give it a very attractive bait because he's got to get the bait. And one of the strongest ones for a believer is to be in the right standing before God as the most common bait. The second type of bait you're going to walk into is the bait of offense. Either one of these two and you've got him. Because then he does second. The third thing he's got to do is he's got to create a real fast way for that trap to close. Because at that point, once in that trap, the more that, that prey struggles, the tired he gets, and he's still not going to get away. And that trap, the fourth thing, it's got to fit the process of the prey that's being caught. Why? Because the more you know about the prey that exists, the more effective trap can be devised. I want to ask the question again. Are you the devil's monkey? I want to tell you something. There are 14 characteristics of a rebellion. 14. 
And when you wind up taking a look at this, please understand them. Number one, if you're in a rebellion function, you are seeking to overthrow the leader. Number two, you are disrupting the leader's ability to effectively lead. Any one of these can be considered rebellion. The next one deals with grumbling against the leader or his methods. The next one deals with the basis of causing dissension or division among the flock. The next one deals with a spirit of defiance. And then you've got a backlog of unconfessed offenses in the body itself. Then you have spiritual blessing and activity of the Holy Spirit that seems to be missing. And next you've got pride. And that's in a form of actively seeking a place of leadership in, as part of the spotlight. The next one is you're suggesting that the leader is not needed or is unworthy at that particular point of the basis to lead. The next thing is you're going to be enticing others to follow rebellious suggestion. You're going to be, constant, you're going to be uh, consulting contrary doctrines that's opposed to the word. Then you've got the unwillingness to repent individually or collectively, and then you're refusing to be counseled with an error. What this does is it produces confusion and disorientation in the body itself. And guess what? Korah had all of these qualities. He had them all. Through one man, in 24 hours, almost 15,000 people are going to die. And in that situation, you've got to realize you do not, teens, want to be following a Korah. You are, you are the next generation, and you're going to, be late. You're going to have the, the hardest way of being able to follow your, your path, and you want to make sure you're not following a chorus. But how do you prevent it? You can take a look at Romans chapter 8, 16, verse 17, and it says this. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which has called divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you have learned and avoid them. What that scripture is saying that you must mark and avoid those that cause division and offenses. But now, what's the criteria? Because that criteria is only according to this scripture. It is only to those who are teaching the doctrine that they have against the doctrine that they have, they have learned. Now, what that means is this. If a leader asks you to avoid or mark a person to maintain unity, and this, this criteria is not met, then this scripture cannot be used as a proof text without it being taken out of context. You get, when you're dealing with the process of doctrine, and there's a wise man that once said, to hold on to anger is like holding on to a hot coal, hoping that it will burn the other person. And in the end, the anger only burns the person who's angry. Make no mistake, that's the truth. The trap is sprung, and Korth and his followers are going to learn this the hard way. But you know what? You know, it's one thing to face the challenge and fail. But to create a crisis, to sow the seed of disunity, to generate strife, and to unnecessarily challenge the leadership, that part of it cannot be excused or ignored. Why? Because what Korah teaches us, God has a set order in his universe. And that set order is his order. He lays out the order for leadership, and he lays out the order for the atoning of God's of the people's sins. And anyone who comes up against God's order is going to be usurping or ignoring the fact of who set that order. And that's a very dangerous situation. When you look at it, you've got to realize that there are principles that has to be put into practice for it to merge from theory into reality. It is not the question that you have to understand as to who is right and who is wrong. It's the question of who is who in that order of God. And, and that's the problem. Moses was God's mediator between mankind 
and him. Aaron was God's high priest, another but slightly lower of a ranking of a mediator. And Korah took his personal agenda and planted it on the national stage and put Israel at risk. Now, this is a type that a threat that cannot be overlooked or tolerated. And fail to you understand this, as I said before, it's going to cost over almost 15,000 Israelites their lives. But as you go through this particular Parsha, you're going to find that the number two runs through this Parsha. You're going to find that it exists of two locations. This is, like I said, this is a strong Parsha. You're going to find two different types of punishment. You're going to type, you're going to understand that Torah absurded two different things, and Moses answered with two different parts, and one of them was mentioned twice, and then you're going to find two separate actions as it's coming right out of the basis of at once, after the punishments were done. But the biggest one deals with the structure of Lashon Hora. When you understand the process, two process, two uh, uh, two, uh, uh, yeah, come on, Ron. Two partials ago, two partials ago was questions Moses' sensitivity, and that's with, with Aaron and Miriam. That was the punishment. Last partial was with the ten spies, and it questioned Moses' competence. This one is going to question Moses' integrity in two different ways. Number one is political, because that is when Dahan and Avram went on. He doesn't last long, but went on, and there's a reason. They are directed at Moses, and the other one is religious with Korah and 250 leaders, some of them from a tribe of Levi, coming at Aaron and Moses. But now the next question you had to do is, what in the world happened to On? Remember, he was one of them at start, but what happened? He got saved by a woman. How about that? When you wind up realizing that there, in Scripture it says that uh, you, the, the wise woman will build her house and the fool will tear it down. The woman in a marriage is the canary in the coal mine for the husband. She is the canary in the coal mine. And the ironic part about it is in a marriage, this says God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. Man was created from the dust of the ground. Women were formed. Major difference. And in that structure, in that structure, when, when, when God has the attributes of Elohim, which is the male, and El Shaddai, which is the woman, and when they are joined together, the marriage becomes a spitting image of God on the face of the earth. And that, that, that is the part of the process of a marriage. And it's going to be the woman that's going to wind up saying it. Because according to a Jewish midrash, it was the wife who takes the action to prevent her husband from joining Korah. Now, Korah is going from house to house, getting support as much as he can, and the wife of On served her husband wine until he fell asleep. Knocked him right out. I mean, that, 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 was, that was cool. And then what she does is she puts herself at the door of their house with her hair uncovered, and her hair exposed. That created a major problem. Because Jewish law, why? Because the Jewish law forbids a married woman to venture outside of her head without her hair being covered. That was at that particular point in time. And On's wife, sitting outside with her hair uncovered, made that entire house un and her husband unapproachable. Which, which was what, what was done to save her. Now, I want you, this is what the rabbis say about the differences between the two wives. They are applying Proverbs 14, verse 1. And it says this, The wises of women build their house, 
And she saved her household with her wisdom. But it's contract with the second part of that verse. But the folly tears it down with her own hands. And this is, the, this is considered the wife of Korah because he wanted to be the leader. And it was he, she pushing it. And she winds up being buried right along with him. So that makes a great deal of difference. And I, 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 I naturally quoted the, the places where you're going to find it in Jewish writings, but you have to understand the power of Lashon Hora. As I said before, it started with Miriam and Aaron and leprosy for Miriam, and that's a seven-day quarantine. That was simple, one person. But then you have another one, ten scouts. That was death and a plague. And the spies died, and the whole generation wound up for 40 years in the wilderness, and only two are going to enter the promised land, Joshua and Caleb, Jew and Gentile. And the next one is dealing with Korah. It's going to be death and plague, but that's going to be the 250 leaders, and later 14,700 people are going to die the next day because of the fact of Korah. Now, you look at the progression one plus 10 plus 250 and 14,700. I'm going to ask you the question again. Are you the devil's monkey? Korah took four steps. The first one, it says, and he took. That means he took an authority that was not his to take. It also said he asserted God's authority and God's chosen order. That is not the right way to take, I tell you that right now. The second one was he rose up. Now, when it says rose up, and you look at it in the element of, of Hebrew, it's like a cobra rising up from a coiled position. That's, that's the picture that's put in the Hebrew word that deals with the basis of rose up. And it says, then they assembled. Now, that becomes a show of force. And in the face of Moses and Aaron... And they said, when they said, they spoke rebellion. Now, what charge did they have against Aaron? You got under, I mean, against Moses. Consider this. They accused him of exalting himself over the community. Now, it says in Numbers chapter 16, verse 3, they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and told them, you have appropriated too much for yourselves from the entire congregation, since all of them are holy, and the, and the Lord is among them too. Why do you exalt yourself over the Lord's assembly? Remember, at the very end of, of Numbers chapter 15, before this started, is the giving of the basis of the seat seat. And the, the, the blue thread, it's the same blue thread that is worn for the, the high priest as it dealt with the faces of the headstrong. This was holy. This made them holy. So this is the process being used. But the difference is they're dealing with order, God's order, not holiness. And there's the difference that struck because of that reason. Now, when you wind up taking, I'll tell you right there, there it is. It come from the last chapter of Tzitzit, and I was talking about the holiness unto the Lord. And what they did is they laced their rebellion with religion. That is that the way they dealt with the rebellion. Now, guess what? As I said before, that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the problem. It, it, that was not the issue. The issue at stake was not the holiness of Israel. It was the order of authority and the leadership that God designed for Israel. Moses was not accused of any kind of sexual misconduct, financial responsibility, or doctrinal error. Moses was accused of being the leader of Israel, and it's the very thing that God called him to do, even when he didn't want it. He did not want it, but God called him to do it. Now, what happens when you when the teens, when you grow, when you grow up, and you understand you're going to find yourself facing this kind of a situation because it's all if all of the individual, all of them, not all members of the congregation was holy, it did not require no priests if they weren't weren't holy. And if, the, if God was present in every individual, it did not require any prophets. And if God is near every individual, then the nation could choose its leaders. And that was the real issue. That was the problem before, right there. Now, 
you would ask yourself a question. What caused Korah to blow a fuse? Now you think about this. It's his lineage. It says that in Numbers chapter 3, verse uh, 19, that the, Kor- the Koranite clans, Aram, Tistar, Hedron, and y- Yazel. That's the order. Now Moses' father was Aram. Korah was the firstborn of Hazar. Hazar is the next person in that line. Now the, the Levi, whole Levi clan was set apart by God, and he believed he was, should have been the leader of the Levites because he was the next one in line as being the first order. But guess what? The firstborn of Azel wound up becoming the leader, and that had to fry him. I'm not kidding you. Now it does record this battle in the Bed Hadashah. And you're going to find that in Jude chapter, June uh, 10 and 11. And it says this. Whatever these people do not understand, they slander. Like ir- to irrational animals, they are destroyed by the very things they know by instinct. How terrible it will be for them. For they lived like Cain did, rushed head on into Balaam's error to make a profit and destroy themselves as happened in Korah's rebellion. Now, when you wind up taking another look in Scripture, I'm going to give you another example that existed of a, of a person that wound up not following God's authority. That man's name is Ahithothal. Who the devil is Ahithothal? Hitherthal was David's chief counselor for 20 years. But he immediately went sideways. He didn't raise up or go down. He became Absalom's counselor. When he became Absalom's counselor, he didn't change his rank in any way, shape, or form, but he wanted to kill David himself. Why? Because he was the father of Elam, one of David's mighty men. He was the father. And it says it in 2 Samuel 23, verse 34. Hahasbi, the uh, Mahakad's son, Elikahat, Ahazazel, the Gilanite's son, Elam. Now, what in the world does that mean? You're going to love this. If you take a look, it says in 2 Samuel 11.3, David sent word to inquire about her, and someone told him, this is Elam's daughter Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He was the grandfather of Bathsheba. And for 20 years, he held it in, but he wanted to kill him. Now that is the basis of another person pulling the rank of authority that God has placed on him. Then when I asked that question, I got to ask you the second question again. Are you the devil's monkey? Okay? Meanwhile, back at the ranch. <laughs> There's the test. Moses is saying, okay, guys, I want you to remember something. Remember Nehob and Abihu? They took their, court, their, their, their censers and they went into the Holy of Holies to light the fire to put on the altar. And God destroyed them with fire. I want you to remember them. Now, here's the test. The leaders, the 250 leaders, were to put hot coals on the fire pan, lay incense on top of it, and take that smoking mixture into the entry to the temple of the meeting. Guess what? God's going to choose who's going to have access to that sacred tent. And he will choose who's going to have control over Israel. Datan and Avram, they have a different way. They they refused even to come to this tent. They were sending a message to Moses saying, hey, we're not going to come up on you guys. They were sinning by rebelling against Moses' authority over them because it was God's divine appointed leader. Now, remember I said about Nehab and Abayu? I wasn't kidding. They had the right to offer incense, 
but the fire comes only from the altar of sacrifice. That's not what they did. They took the fire they, they put in and used it for the altar of incense. And that, that act, we dealt with the basis right act or wrong fire was their sin. And what did God do? He killed them. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you study the, the record of, of uh, uh, Nehob and Abihu, what it says, and you see these pictures of the fire coming down, but it says the fire cooked them from the inside out. They cooked them from the inside out. And that, 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 that's, a, that, that's not the picture you see when it's on to it. And it says there, Therefore you and your group have cons conspired against the Lord and Aaron. What is that that causes you to complain against him? Moses told them to sleep on it. And they wouldn't listen. So what happens? The God's glory appeared to the whole congregation. Now somebody's in trouble. And, Mo, and what does God say? He tells Moses and Aaron to step aside. He's going to annihilate everybody involved. And that comes in right out of Numbers chapter 16, verse 20 to 21. Then the Lord told Moses and Aaron, separate, your, separate yourself from this community, and I will destroy them in a moment. It's called collective punishment. Then he told the community, Moses, Move away from the camps of those wicked men and don't touch anything that belongs to them. That way you will not be destroyed along with their sins. Moses' warning to the crowd was to move away from the tents of the rebels. They distanced themselves and the announcement of the expected punishment. It was immediate fulfillment of the earth opening up and the reaction of those present at the punishment. Now, when you realize that that was happening, guess what? You ask yourself another question. What's going on at that time at the entrance of the dead of meetings? Because this is going to happen at the same time. And the scripture jumps back over to the test of the censors. I'm going to write one. Good. <laughs> And it says, and fire came out from before God and consumed all 250 men who offered the incense. God warned them. Moses warned them. And they got the same punishment as Nehob and Abihu. The fire coming from God did not take place after the splitting of the earth. The two punishments, these different locations, different in nature, it took place simultaneously. It was like a double feature all wrapped up into one feature in that situation, and it dealt measure for measure. How about that? One punishment was fire coming before God, and it came down to the earth from heaven and consumed the 250 men who offered incense. The second punishment came from beneath the earth upwards, and it says that the earth that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them. You have to understand about the content of the punishment with the 250 leaders. The 250 leaders wanted to elevate themselves to the position of the Aaronic priesthood. That's the offering of the incense. Their sin involved the desire to move upward toward Yeshua, or toward Yudhei and his service. They wanted to reach heaven. So the fire came down from heaven. They reached it. The content of the punishment of Dayton and Avram and their supporters. They wanted to inherit a land, fields and vinelands. They wanted, they praised Egypt as being a land flowing with milk and honey. They were already said, you're not going into the land. So now they want to go back to Egypt. They, and what happened is they regretted that Moses took them out of Egypt. They did not want to ascend. We will not go up. They, they refused to go up to no, negotiate peace with Moses and then going down to their death. The earth was the source of their sin and it was the earth that started the punishment. Not only their bodies were swallowed up, but also everything that was theirs, their houses and all of their property. The people did not learn the lesson. They didn't learn it. The very next day, Numbers chapter 16, verse 41, nevertheless, the very next day, the whole congregation of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, you have killed the Lord's people. God lost it again. Now you're looking at a plague. It's going to start. 
a rebellion started by three men spread it to 250 and was responsible for the death of 15,000 people. Again, are you the devil's monkey? It's as simple as that. Aaron takes his candor. Now, he's going he's gonna to try to stop this plague. Now, what, what, what caused a, a, a destruction of death, this destruction of death is now going to be straightened out because Aaron's going to take that, oh, thank you. Aaron's going to take that canter, and what he's going to do is he's going to put the incense, and now he stands between the living and the dead, stopping the plague. What was destroying them and it started it is now being used to stop it, but it's with the right person. This canter in the wrong hand brought death, but now the canter in the right hand brought life through grace. So what happens? Do you believe this is settled? Is everything settled? No. What we have now is a test of the basis of who is going to be God's set-apart servants. And there's another test. It's called the test of the shafts we've devised. They're going to take one, shaft, one, shaft, one staff per tribe, and the tribal leader had control over it. And each tribe is going to set his staff down before God for him to choose who represented and served him. Now the staffs are going to be placed on the inside of the holies of holies before the Ark of the Covenant. And it's above the Ark where the presence of God dwelt. And the one chosen will have his staff long dead made alive. That is resurrection. And the staffs were left overnight. Now, what were the results? Aaron's staff was in full bloom. It spouted, produced blossoms, and was fully formed almonds. Man, game over. Now, how does Aaron's budding staff connect to an early ordinances of God? You're going to love this. The Hebrew word for bud or blossoms is tzitzit. It's the same root word that is used for this. Tassels are fringe. And it's used for that same cord that is put on the headband of the high priest. Same word. And it has the holiness of the Lord written onto it. It's the, it's, it's the design of the menorah in the temple, in the tabernacle, had almond blossoms on it. Seats it in its gold construction, and the buds on the staff, the headpiece, the tassels, and the garments were all menorah, was all represented in aspect of holiness. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Take a look in the King James as it describes the menorah in the tabernacle. What it says is, says, his blossoms, his stems, his flowers, his fruit. It doesn't say it. It's talking about a person. And that person is the Messiah as the light of the world. That may help you a little bit on something. But now why almonds and blossoms? The almond is the first tree to blossom after the winter. And it's the first to come alive after a season of death and dormancy. Now, the almond is going to bear a white blossom, which represents purity, holiness, and God himself. And that's the reason why women will choose white on their wedding day. But now I'm going to talk to you something, guys. This is where, when you walk out of here, you are really going to be able to understand why it is necessary for you to understand your own faith. Please remember something. You're talking to an ex-atheist. There's a modern-day Korah faith trap that exists. Whenever you deal with a faith as an atheist, faith without evidence or proof, you just believe. An atheist will go after that like you will not believe. It is not a force. You just believe. Or it's pretending you know something you don't know. Faith is not a leap without reason. That is, you've got to have reason to go with that faith. 
but but the kind of faith that that has no evidence or proof to back up your faith, that's not biblical faith. It's not a force. It is a step of trust based on the evidence itself. I didn't say that. The Word of God says that. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, And after he had suffered, he showed himself, Yeshua showed himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during the period of 40 days and telling them about the kingdom of God. Take a look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22. It's Peter talking. And Peter talking, and on Shavuot, he says, Listen to these words, fellow Israelites. Yeshua of Nazareth was a man whose divine authority was clearly proven to you by all of the miracles and wonders which God performed through him. You yourselves know this, for it happened here among you. Now, if you wind up going into Acts chapter 17, verse 2 and 3, it says, And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Yeshua whom I proclaim to you is the Messiah. But here's the best one. John chapter 20, verse 31, 30 to 31. It says, Yeshua performed many other miracles. That the disciples saw these miracles were not written in his book. But these miracles have been written so that you will believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, so that you will have life on the basis of believing in him. You deal with the faces of faith because I guarantee you, if you don't, an atheist is going to nail you to the wall. One of the strongest faith things that deals with an atheist is the fact that if you can tell you how you believe, what you believe, but if you can't tell you why you believe it, you're in serious trouble. And the only way you're going to learn the element of why you believe is coming from the basis as far as your understanding of the scriptures themselves. Now, you guys are brand new who walked in here. Anyone who has been in the mental, in, in, in ministry or in Messianic Judaism know that there's a certain procedure that's going to happen to you. And if you, do, if you don't lock in and stop it, you are going to become an apostate or you're going to convert to Judaism itself. Now, I'm going to explain what's going to happen. A Gentile is going to come in here. He's just learning. And guess what? The first thing he's going to do is he is going to be fascinated by what's coming. I mean, he is going to be overloaded. He's going to be learning things that you did not know before. He is going to be blown away by everything that's going on. Particularly the first year, he's going to the feast. Oh, wow, this is fantastic. I never knew this even existed before. He is fascinated about it. Then the second thing that's going to happen, it's going to stimulate him. He's going to go into the Bible. He's going to go 90 miles an hour going through the Bible. He's going, to, he's going to learn the Word of God more. He's going to learn about the basis of the Jewish roots more. That's the process of what's going to happen when you first come in. The next step is dealing with complication. Here's where we start to have problems. Because, I'm not kidding you. Because on complications, now you've got to understand, how do we handle this? What do we do with this? How do we do the feast? What, do we, what is your level of cash root? What is the basis of, do we do Christmas or not? Or, or do we deal with Easter versus pa Passover? That, that, that is the structure that, that will walk into every Gentile brain in the process of Messianic Judaism. And if you wind up dealing with the process of not locking it out of Yeshua or forgetting about Yeshua, this is where you're going to find yourself trapped. And the more that's happening in this particular one, you find out, oh, this is the right way to go. And no, you're not doing that way. You're not doing that way. I don't like you. You're not doing this way. And now judgmental attitude walks in. That's exactly what's going to happen. I guarantee it. So when, if you're in this, this ministry, you just, you're in this, you're this movement, and you just walked into it, remember what's happening. Because you're going to wind up dealing with the process of it, because now what's going to happen Suffocation. You're the, you have been overloaded you, in this part because of everything that you're trying to work out on, the, on these questions. You are going to lose your spiritual life. And in that structure, you're not going to be worshiping Yeshua as Lord. 
You're going to be trying to work out the distance of this. You're going to forget about Yeshua as Lord. And then you're not going to be sharing Yeshua to other people. When that happens, the next step is apostate. It's, it's a bad walk, but it happens because at this particular point, you, you can't go back to the church because of the Shabbat, and you've got this real problem on the basis of understanding. Now where are you going to go? I'm not going anywhere. And it, you, you, at that particular point, you, you, you lose the band of, of togetherness that exists, and at that situation, you're dealing with denying Yeshua. That's what will happen. And as a Gentile with the studying of the Judaism and being able to do it in showing how much you believe, then that meant, maybe, hey, I want to tell you something. I will pay it. I'm telling you right now. And at that particular point, in my house, we are kosher. I have, I, I, my utilities are kosher. So don't panic on me. I'm, 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 I'm just telling you where I'm at. But I, I haven't changed anything in my walk. I'm, 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 I haven't changed anything. But I'm telling you where your trap is in this process, and, and you're going to convert to Judaism. Now, how do you prevent that? How do you add protection to lack up onto it? You deal with prayer. You pray for guidance, and you pray for a receptive heart to be able to get you through the element of the complication process. Because once you hit that complication process, if you keep Yeshua as the number one guide in your life, and you're, you're, you're going to get past that complication one, and you're going to go the right path instead of going down the wrong path. This is the walk of a Messianic believer if he doesn't, if he doesn't want it out. This is the danger of your walk as a Messianic believer. I am not kidding. Whew. All right. Take a look at the message from Korah. Yod -Hey -Vah, you got three messages here from Korah. Yod -Hey -Vah -Hey chooses leaders that stretch his people, taking them out of their comfort zone. If you feel like you're being stretched and taken out of your comfort zone, praise God, because that's exactly what, you, what, he, what the leader's supposed to do. And if you're not being stretched out of your comfort zone, then you're not being led. It's as simple as that. Number two. Yod Hey Vah Hey called you to be yourself, and it's time for you to get your act together personally, to work together in the body of the Messiah, to accept, embrace, pursue your own particular calling and God given destiny. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This can go problems with other people, but it's got to get done. It's as simple as that. Number three, this is good. You have two choices before you. You can take your holy land, which is your destiny that Yod Hei Vah -Hey has given you, or you can die in some hole in the wilderness. Now I'm going to tell you a story. What I want you guys to do is I want you to picture in your minds this picture. A lake. And it's raining. Some raindrops are coming down hard and some are soft. And it's hitting the water. And as it hits the water, it produces ripples. Now, there's someone else there. There's a man at one end of that lake. And what he's going to do is he's going to take a rock and he's going to skip it across that lake. As it gets closer to the end of that lake, it's going to do boom, 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 boom. A lot of bumps into that water trying to get to that other side. And the final rock is going to drop on the other side and it creates the ripples. The rock ripples are big. You've got the one with the fast one, bigger, the smaller, but, but middle size, and you've got the little sprinkles, little one. You and I are the lake. The raindrops are the decisions you make in your life. The ripples are the consequences, good or bad, that's going to result from those decisions in your life. The person throwing the rock straight across that lake is God. And that, as that rock hits that water and you make your decision, the ripples of that decision are the consequences, good or bad, is a lot stronger and carries a lot longer in your life. As it gets closer to the end of the lake, which is the end of your life, 
it's getting a lot faster. The ripples are joining together in the consequences of your decision because the Bible says, he that overcomes. And when it hits that other rock, gets on the other side, that is when the, uh, that rock represented your decision, good or bad, as to where you go after God calls you home. Now, how's that for a few subtraction? Now, the choice and its consequences are yours. Are you God's priest and servant, or are you the devil's monkey? Shabbat shalom.